At the end of the Second World War, Africa had not yet entered the race for independence. Throughout the continent, white governors were confident that for as long as they lived, the imperial system would go on with the cooperation of the traditional chiefs. But in the Gold Coast, independence came with unexpected speed. Kwame Nkrumah was its nationalist leader. As president of independent Ghana, Nkrumah inspired the nationalist movements that were to sweep the colonial powers out of Africa. Hundred years ago, the British and Africans prospered together, selling gold and slaves. Then the Gold Coast became the world's biggest producer of cocoa. It was seen as the model colony, but in February 1948, the complacent British rulers suffered a terrible shock. A violent incident took place in Accra, the capital. A demonstration of 2,000 people protesting against the poor treatment of ex-servicemen got out of control. Twelve policemen had the job of stopping them from getting to Christianborg Castle, the home of the colonial governor. The two sides met at Christianborg Crossroads. When we got to the crossroad, we were held up because we were then marching in the columns. And then what we saw was, uh, I mean, a resistance from the British uh, superintendent of police, Mr. Emery, will not allow us to further our advance to the castle. The crowd in front were very close, perhaps 20... 25 yards, I don't know. Um, I gave the order to fire, and nothing happened at all. Um, we were obviously going to get overrun at any moment, and uh, I retreated back onto the firing party and uh, tore a rifle out of the hands of one of the men, and I myself fired at a uh, man in front who was urging the crowd forward. And he was killed. And I think I fired a total of another five shots. And uh, the crowd turned around and made off. By nightfall, the city of Accra was in flames. Looters had stripped the stores of their goods and rioters had opened the jails and released the prisoners. European women and children had been evacuated to places of safety. Within days, rioting broke out in towns throughout the colony. 29 died and over 200 were injured. It was a terrible uh, sight because uh, going through the streets, all the windows were smashed. Um, people were wandering around, I think, uh, very happy with having had some drink. and. Um, uh, so many cars had been turned over. We brought out the fire brigade, uh, but there was little we could do. We did save a few buildings from burning, but uh, uh, some of the citizens were actually slashing the, uh, the, the houses with cutlasses, so we had to arm the fire brigade. The executive of the United Gold Coast Convention, the party of educated professionals, immediately sent a telegram to the colonial office in London. This thing happened on a Saturday, 20th. On the 29th, the leaders of the convention saw a government official, and the person of Jimmy Moxon, and told him exactly what we had done, that we had sent a telegram to the Secretary of State asking that he should send a commission for the government had broken down. Police unable to protect life and property since early afternoon yesterday. Governor Creasy to be recalled and relieved of his onerous and impossible burden. The convention leaders offered to form a government. The governor, Sir Gerald Creasy, surprised them with his response. 
We were not expecting to be arrested. But we were arrested, and we didn't actually, weren't very angry, uh, uh, because they came and said, well, we don't really know whether you are the cause of it. But your presence here does not seem to conduce to peace, so we'll take you away. Oh, I think it's not unfair to say Creasy panicked. You see, it was a situation which was totally beyond his ex previous experience. He had been in charge of the African Division, but he had never served, as far as I know, in any capacity in any overseas territory. And he was just simply bewildered and he just sort of threshed around trying to clutch at straws here and there. When the news broke at the colonial office that Saturday evening, the whole African department was called in. They feared that the situation was out of control and that the governor was losing his grip. There were too many telegrams and all marked most immediate, uh, which had to be dealt with instantly, day or night. And we felt that the messages in those telegrams might have been referred to some of the other people on the spot who understood the African mind much better. The Labour government had been trying to give a share of power to Africans in all the British territories, but the old hands who ran them would have none of it. And to the French, Belgians, Portuguese, Spanish and Italians in their colonies, such ideas were beyond belief. Now the riots in the Gold Coast gave the Labour ministers their chance. They sent out a team, headed by Aiken Watson, a Labour Party supporter and lawyer, to say what should be done. His report said frustration over high prices and slow progress in housing, education and African political rights demanded action. Watson proposed that over the next ten years, self-government should be introduced, with one man, one vote. Exactly what the colonial diehards said would undermine both British rule and political stability in Africa. The colonial secretary, Arthur Creech Jones, accepted the report. I think it was the turning point in British policy in Africa because the courage which Creech Jones as the colonial secretary and Andrew Cohen as the head of the African section of the colonial office showed in determining to go straight through with accepting its proposals created a momentum which led inevitably to independence for Ghana even though the Labour government by that time had disappeared. This reversal of policy led to five out of six of the men who had been jailed after the riots being picked to join an all-black committee to say how the country should be governed. The British believed that they would now have to share power with this moderate, educated elite if they were to keep their influence in Africa. But while the committee were preparing their report, there was a split in the ranks of the convention. Kwame Nkrumah, their paid general secretary, led a massive breakaway movement calling it the Convention People's Party, the CPP. From the moment he'd returned from England 18 months earlier to work for them, Nkrumah had made his strategy clear to the convention leaders. At the first meeting, Kwame explained to them very clearly the sort of uh, program which he was going to follow. He recommended that there should be a very strong organization and that uh, there should be branches all over the country, and that their demand for self-government should be backed with demonstrations, strikes, and boycotts, which, of course, uh, the, uh, CP the UGCC leaders did not like, nor were they enamored with uh, his uh, fiery speeches and uh, trenchant articles against imperialism and... Uh, and uh, decolonization. And therefore, they, uh, those of us who were close to Kwame were not looked at in a favorable light. He had come encouraged by some of our friends in England um, to watch the people he called reactionaries. And actually, talking to him, I got the impression that he wasn't going to be with us for long. Well, he regarded most of us as being reactionary. The aristocratic leaders of the convention were professional men who had never been at ease with the semi-educated people who were about to get the vote. Kwame Nkrumah had been born in a poor fishing village, but he'd worked his way through universities in America and England, where he led African student movements. 
He demanded immediate self-government from the British and challenged the traditional authority of the chiefs. Nkrumah championed the interests of the common people and knew how to appeal to them. Well, Nkrumah was a very good public speaker. Um, he uses sometimes questions like, do you want to continue to live under colonial rule? And of course the people would shout, no. We can no longer continue to be under oppression. We must fight for independence at all costs. We must prepare to go to prison. We must prepare to suffer all kinds of indignities, but we will fight until we win. Um, he also used a lot of gestures, um, paced up and down, looked at the people, um, could pick groups like organize the youth, the market women. We call upon the, the aged, we call upon the ex-servicemen, we call upon the workers, I mean, naming the groups so that everybody felt that he was a part of the struggle. And um, he also had a way of making people believe that he was very serious in what he was talking about. And I think that went a very long way in getting the people organized. Two months after Nkrumah had formed the CPP, a new governor arrived at the castle, Sir Charles Arden Clark, a stubborn man who was not to be deflected from his policies, even by instructions from London. Well, Arden Clark, he was a splendid old world governor. He was a man that we all greatly admired. I was very fond of him. But he'd been brought up, of course, when he would run a huge district in Nigeria on his own with no interference from anyone. Then, as he advanced, well, there were things like dispatches from the Secretary of State, and uh, later we'd be getting cables and so on. But he didn't really take to this too much. And as for the telephone, I think I must have been his secretary. I was in the adjoining room one day when I heard him saying again and again, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. And he came into my office and said, that was the Secretary of State, I'm not going to have him telephoning me. Within weeks of his arrival, Sir Charles Arden Clark faced his first crisis. The All Black Committee on the Constitution reported, and its proposals fell far short of Nkrumah's demand for self-government now. The CPP's response was to threaten a campaign of strikes and civil disobedience, which they called positive action. Krobo Odusi was an influential member of the CPP Central Committee. Positive action, the goals of for independence now. And uh, we link it with uh, India, because India state positive action during the time of Gandhi and they achieved independence. So we said you wanted to declare positive action, all our supporters should stay out of work so that the British government will know what our demands are. And we warn them that nobody should act violently. It must all be without violence. Support for positive action was widespread and the newly formed unions were firmly behind it. The government feared that violence and strikes would bring the country to a halt. Chief Secretary Reginald Salloway had served in India and had faced civil disobedience before. He decided that for the first time, the government should talk with Nkrumah. Salloway was quite superb at that meeting. Uh, he talked about uh, positive action which had covered in Krumer's Accra Evening News, his newspaper, for weeks and weeks, and said that he thought, from his short knowledge of the Gold Coast, that the claim that they would run this as a non-violent campaign was an illusion. 
and that this would lead to violence and to bloodshed and that this was unnecessary. There had been the Kusi Commission, which had promised within six months uh, general elections. And uh, Reg Salloway said that uh, if your claim to represent the vast mass of people in this country is substantial, then put it to the test in six months instead of putting the country to violence straight away. And that is a clear choice that you have. But if you choose to launch positive action now, I tell you it will end in violence and any bloodshed will be on your head. After the interview with uh, the Chief Secretary, uh, uh, Reginald Soloway, had failed to give us the answer we required, Kwame went to the arena. In fact, the crowd had already gathered there. And there, he declared positive action. The thing had been very effective. The opposition was telling them that they can't do it. But when it became so very effective and spread throughout the whole country, even in the north, then they, they felt that uh, the thing was serious. They were creating a great deal of trouble, turning against the chiefs, turning against government officials, and creating a state in which you could do nothing except stop it. And stop it, we did. I attended a meeting with Arden Clark and Brannigan, the Attorney General, and we decided that there had to be a declaration of a state of emergency, and so uh, all the ringleaders were immediately arrested. This was done very rapidly, almost overnight. About 100 people were taken into custody. There were no deaths, except of two policemen. And um, the whole affair fizzled out in a matter of a few days. With the CPP leaders in jail, the British expected that the convention would have a clear run to victory in the forthcoming election. But it was not to be so easy. By a remarkable coincidence, as Kwame Nkrumah entered prison, one of his most trusted lieutenants was coming out. Komla Bedema had completed a six-month sentence and immediately set about repairing the damage to the party. Well, I, I realized that uh, somebody had to keep Nkrumah's image before the eyes of the people, and uh, I felt that was my duty to the extent that I had a, a life-size photograph made of him, which I carried as part of my paraphernalia going around the country. Erasing it, I let people see, this is the man who is in jail. We must go on fighting. His body is in jail, but his spirits must go on. Bedema had a genius for organization, and soon the CPP colors were everywhere, even on self-government now dresses. Bedema reminded the people about their absent leader languishing in jail and invented a new honor, the title of prison graduate. Well, when I came out of jail, my father and Mr. A.Y.K. Jin were the only two people who met me at the prison gates. I didn't like that. So I thought other people who were then in jail should come out as heroes and I organized the prison graduate idea? Well, it was the equivalent of the old school tie. Those who had been uh, in jail in association, in connection with some uh, civil unrest or libel actions and that sort of thing, were qualified in the eyes of the CPP to wear a uniform. And uh, that consisted of a white hat and a Northern Territory smock. And this was a very helpful image to them. It helped to sell the idea of a party which was prepared to sacrifice its um, leaders in the public cause. The first few were, had maybe 100 people, but after the first two or three, they came out in thousands to meet them. And we paraded the streets without, without a permit. We paraded the streets and... Uh, the government didn't begin to like the idea, so they thought they should stop us. But the nationalist tide was moving so high, they didn't want to do it by force. First, they thought they could uh, 
leave the prisoner go uh, uh, some time before he was due to come out officially. So, yeah, I remember the first instance we went to his house. He had been left about four o'clock in the morning. We went and brought him to the prison gate and performed our ceremonies. In February 1951, the election was called. Vedema organized the CPP campaign. The prison graduates drummed home and Krumah's slogans. We prefer self-government with danger to servitude in tranquility. Above all, there was one clear demand. Self-government now. Self-government now. The CPP campaigned in a new way. They were prepared to sleep on verandas with the boys popularly called veranda boys, because most of them were sleeping in verandas at the time. And when they went out to the villages, they trucked down together, sang their songs, drank palm wine in street bars, street corners with them, and virtually were prepared to throw their lot in with them at all times, at all places. Now this, Dangwa and others were not prepared to do. No, indeed, would they have been proved honest if they had attempted to do it, because it just didn't suit them. It wasn't in their character, it wasn't in their makeup, and they could not pretend to be with them in those directions without exposing their own hypocrisy. The British believed they had introduced an electoral system that would favor the elite. In the country areas, members were to be chosen by the chiefs. In the towns, by one man, one vote. The election day was February the 8th. I remember that night very clearly, even after 30 years. The crowds were milling on what is now, well, it was the old polo ground. There were thousands of people there waiting anxiously for the results. At about uh, soon after midnight, the final results were known and the CPP had won by a, 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 a large majority. And uh, the late Mr. Salloway, who was then the chief secretary, called me and said, Mr. Gilema, you, you must tell your people. So I, quite unprepared, I stood up and I said, now, at long last, the people of this country have spoken the language which the imperialists understand the language of the ballot box. We have won this election. And the roars which came from the thousands still rings my ears. To the dismay of the British, the prison graduates swept the board. But Nkrumah was in jail with another two years to serve of his sentence. The governor faced a difficult decision. Nkrumah had flouted the law and had been found guilty. Should he release Nkrumah and reward the man who had unleashed positive action, or keep him in jail and risk riots and the prospect of a government guided from a prison cell? Arden Clark finally decided that Nkrumah should be released from prison at one o'clock on Monday, the 12th of February, 1951. We, we had an excellent view as my office was just across the road from the, the uh, uh, James Fort prison. In fact, we had quite a bundle of the world press up there. We were amazed, all of us, to see how quickly the streets filled. It was an extremely moving scene. From that point, he was taken by his party members straight to the arena where he was presented to the public. And then, very shortly afterwards, he was called by Arden Clark to the castle and uh, told that uh, he had to form a government. The governor and Nkrumah formed a cabinet of three British civil servants and eight Africans. The world watched to see how they would cope. Kwame Nkrumah had been released from prison to become leader of the government. He headed an executive of 11 ministers. The three British civil servants controlled finance, defense, and justice. The new African ministers controlled the rest. Well, it, it, it basically, they, they, they hadn't done in, any kind of government job at all before and they, they hadn't really understood that they had to work regular office hours. Um, and the idea was to go off and address public meetings, like, 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 like good politicians, they thought. I must say that uh, it's not an easy transformation from an agitator to a responsible cabinet position. But we had to 
realize the fact that we were no more on the soapbox or on the platform, but we had to see that the affairs of this country were properly run. That was not easy, but within months we had got that image imprinted on ourselves. As we went along, uh, we never directly opposed any particular minister in any of the things he wanted. We found that um, by talking through and round a subject, one got uh, general agreement. I have no recollection of the governor at any time having to put any question in executive council to a vote. So I think that shows that we were able to establish an extremely good relationship with the African ministers. Arden Clark and Nkrumah were at first suspicious of each other, but they soon formed a close partnership and together they plotted a careful course between the conflicting demands of the colonial office and the CPP. There was harmony. There was great harmony. And uh, he used to go to him frequently, uh, two or three times a week. Sometimes Arden Clark would send for him, but sometimes he would come up on his own. And I think this uh, pleased Arden Clark. He was, in fact, his blue-eyed boy, really, you know. In October 1951, the Conservative Party won the general election. The new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, and the Colonial Secretary, Oliver Littleton, thought that events in the Gold Coast were moving too fast. Littleton went out to see for himself. Sir William Gorrell Barnes, in charge of the Africa desk of the Colonial Office, went with him. There would have been great advantages in slaying First of all, for the benefit of people in the Gold Coast themselves, and secondly, from the point of uh, the repercussions which were bound to follow elsewhere, first on the west coast and then in the rest of Africa. But, of course, there was very little room for manoeuvre. The colony was the world's largest producer of cocoa. Revenue was booming, and the CPP ministers in Accra were determined to pass on the benefits. They made primary schooling free for all and in three years doubled the school population. Health care was extended throughout the colony and a house building program was launched. Money was poured into industry, road building and harbour development. But as the Gold Coast was enjoying this period of rapid modernization, one of its traditional customs, dash, or the receipt of gifts for favours, was also taking on a modern and less acceptable form. Well, we didn't meet corruption face to face in the office. It did become reflected in the kind of people who were passing through all ministers' offices. There were a number of carpet-bagging businessmen who made one feel uncomfortable at the time. There was one case that came to us in the Ministry of Communications and Works where an American chap produced some fantastic housing scheme, which was going to cost three and a half million, something of the sort. And uh, we got wind of this and examined it and were able to shoot it down. Well, this made us very unpopular because this cut the ministers off from the 10% of whatever it was they were going to get on this contract. And uh, so after one or two occasions like that, they kept these things very quiet didn't put these propositions to us to be examined and considered. Uh, they signed on the dotted line and then told us what was going to happen and that it was for us to put the thing into effect. In spite of the corruption, in less than three years, Kwame Nkrumah and his prison graduates had convinced the British government that they were able to govern themselves. In 1954, the second Gold Coast election was announced and the CPP leaders were in no doubt about its significance. The 51 election was just to establish the government. Now, several discussions took place after that regarding the granting of independence. And it was uh, agreed with the British government that uh, if we won the, the uh, 54 elections, independence would follow.
With independence in sight, Nkrumah and his ministers launched their manifesto in Accra Stadium, telling voters, vote CPP and we'll finish the job. The opposition, united only in its dislike of Nkrumah, raised doubts about his party, which were to grow into a dangerous challenge. One opposition candidate was Nancy Tsibu. CPP was a bit corrupt at that time, and money was all, and if you didn't belong to it, you were not given any share of whatever was happening in the country. So we kicked against it. My campaigning was more or less on moral issues, because at that time, the youth were up against the elders and the chiefs of the country. And as a woman, I, we didn't like it that way at all. Because in our tradition, we respected our elders and especially our chiefs. On election night, the CPP swept back with more than two-thirds of the seats in the Legislative Assembly. Independence seemed a step away. Freedom! It is now... I don't think I have much to say now because we are now beginning. I want to thank the management, men and women of Accra for their great support. Again, I thank you all. Let's hope for the best. Freedom. For the first time in a British colony, Africans were given control of an entire cabinet. There were no British ministers. On this eventful occasion, my colleagues and I are very happy to be the first members of the first African cabinet. The people of the country have reaffirmed their confidence in us and have given us the mandate to carry on and finish the job. Nkrumah's hopes for a trouble-free transition to independence were soon destroyed by the leaders of Ashanti. The Ashantis had been among the greatest warriors in Africa and once ruled an empire as large as the Gold Coast itself. They were fiercely loyal to the Asantahini, the ruler of their kingdom, and to their ancient system of government. Ashanti was the wealthiest region in the colony, rich in cocoa and gold. Within weeks of the election, the Ashanti chiefs and cocoa farmers launched the National Liberation Movement to battle for a federal system of government to protect the power, the wealth, and the traditions of their region from the central government in Accra. It was led by a senior minister in the Asantahini's court, Bafora Koto. The very day we are inaugurating uh, uh, NLM, they started stone throwing. They even sent people on the way. When the people are coming to a rally, they told them that the rally didn't go on, so they must return. And few people who came they stoned their cars. And even when they were in the ready, they stoned us with the bottles and stones, while the police were standing unconcerned. But as we were determined to deliver Ashanti and part of the country from Nkrumah, we were also determined. I've told them that, you, I don't want you to be a violent, but when anybody attack you, try to defend yourself. In Ashanti, both the National Liberation Movement and the CPP created strong-arm gangs called Action Groupers and Action Troopers to travel the region threatening each other's supporters. The intimidation turned to killing when the CPP's propaganda chief stabbed to death E.Y. Baffo, 
a national liberation movement leader. The political parties were now facing each other in gang warfare. Oh God, when, after Bafu's death, we saw that, oh, I see, if the sin has become killing, then we shall also wake up and kill. Then we started vigorously with anybody. We were fighting here and there. And so we could do similar as they did. We were trying to do it too. And we also swore that if anybody dares to commit a crime on the name of our member, we shall also revenge. And then it became a hectic game. Hectic game, instead of uh, this thing, normal struggle of, for this thing, uh, uh, campaigning for each party, after it became a threatening affair. And so that was the end of the game. The action groupers of the National Liberation Movement took control of key areas. CPP supporters in the Ashanti capital, Kumasi, were forced to flee and take refuge in Accra. It became unsafe for Nkrumah and his ministers to visit Ashanti. The governor, Sir Charles Arden Clark, was thought to be a supporter of Nkrumah, and when he came to Kumasi for a routine visit, he received a rough reception. And we were driving along very slowly, and all these people were piled up on the side of the road, so we couldn't drive quickly. And then we, we heard stones hitting the car as we went by. And the agitators were brandishing their fists and yelling in the vernacular. I couldn't understand what they were saying, fortunately, perhaps. The Ashantis had come to the conclusion that it was in Krumah's mouthpiece, and not the mouthpiece of the British government and that uh, anything he came to say, he had previously discussed with Nkrumah, and maybe because Nkrumah could not visit Kumasi at that time, he had come forward as governor to put across Nkrumah's views, and therefore they decided that if Nkrumah could not come, his surrogate should not come. The Northern Territories were also in favor of a federal system of government to protect their region. This was the poorest and least developed part of the Gold Coast. It had been a British protectorate since the days of Queen Victoria. Their chiefs were strongly opposed to the idea of rapid independence and said they feared that the benevolent protection of the British would be replaced by domination by black men from the south. So um, we sent a delegation to Beijing and I spoke for the, for the Northern Territories and I told them that uh, when the chiefs of the Northern Territories entered into, uh, what is it, treaties for protection with the British Crown, um, they understood it to mean not only protection from internal and external uh, threats, but also a responsibility on the part of the British Crown to lead the people, you know, um, to stand on their feet and be able to manage their own affairs. Now, we felt Britain had not honorably uh, played uh, her part in and, and, and that aspect. And I told them that, well, when the first British men came to our place, they told our fathers to look to them and that they were going to lead them step by step into a prosperous and happy uh, 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 country. And they believed them and felt the white man never lied. I, I used that expression, I said, they believed the white man never lied, but it appears you are going back on your word, which means you, <laughs> you are not going to lie to them to use that word. So I thought Britain had a moral obligation, you know, to um, help us out of our present difficulty. In Ashanti, the violence was getting worse. It spread to Accra and even reached the prime minister's house. There was a very strong smell coming up from below. And uh, I thought at the time, you know, it's a bit off to think this is a prime minister's residence, all this dreadful, you can't even sort of sit and chat without this dreadful noise and the awful smells coming up. And suddenly a terrific lot of smoke came up, sort of, you know, yellowy, grey smoke, with a very strong smell of, well, I said, it smells like fireworks. And... Um, when I, as soon as I said this, uh, two of these chaps said, my God, fireworks, you know, and jumped up and went downstairs, and they'd hardly got to the bottom of the steps 
when this terrific explosion happened. And there was a dreadful shattering of glass, you know, and all this sort of thing. But miraculously, nobody was hurt. The police told Nkrumah there was enough gelignite to destroy the building. After two years of violence, the National Liberation Movement campaign had convinced the colonial secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, that yet another election must be held. And Krumer sent his two most trusted colleagues to resist. Now, we had gone to London to try and convince the secretary of state that it was not fair to us, having fought an election in 54, barely two years later, to have to fight a second election before independence. Uh, when we arrived, we found Lennox Boyd absolutely unyielding. And he disarmed us by saying, look, gentlemen, Mr. Bozio, Mr. Benema, if I must put the Ghana Gold Coast Independence Act before parliament, they must be prepared to back me. I can't go and have it rejected. And their condition is that they would like to hand over to the majority party in the country. And reports they had been having were to the effect that the CPP had lost its majority. We tried to convince him that this was not true, but he would not yield. The CPP faced an opposition united behind a clear demand. They wanted a federal system of government to give power to the regions and prevent domination from Accra. Among the National Liberation Movement's chief campaigners was Joe Appiah, a former close associate of Nkrumah, who had defected to the opposition. He recalls what he told the voters. Basically, I told them of the corruption. I told them of the burdening tyranny that we could foresee ahead. I told them why we had struggled for independence. I told them we did not want to sack the British Raj in order to substitute a black Raj. And I explained to them that in the light of the facts as we saw them, in the light of the evidence available, these were foreboding times. In spite of a vigorous campaign by the opposition, the CPP won with a massive majority. But the National Liberation Movement were not prepared to give up. They refused to take their seats in the Legislative Assembly, refused to discuss independence, and told the Colonial Secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, that although they'd lost the election, they'd won the argument for a federal constitution. Our argument was that we had carried overwhelmingly the northern region, we had carried overwhelmingly the Ashanti region, we had shared the honors equally with the CPP in the Transporter Trust Territory, and that the only areas where they had won decisively were the two eastern and western regions. We also pointed out at the time that whereas it took about seven to 8,000 votes to win a seat in Ashanti or the north, you only needed between two and 3,000 votes to win a seat in one of the eastern or western uh, provinces. So we were claiming then that out of the five regions, since we had effectively carried two and shared the honors with the CPP in the third, there was a strong case for a federal constitution. But the CPP had won 57% of the votes and more than two-thirds of the seats. The British government rejected the federal argument. On September the 18th, 1956, Nkrumah was empowered to announce that full independence would follow in six months. In Ashanti, this provoked a furious reaction. They talked of breaking away from the Gold Coast and renewed threats of violence and disorder. Lennox Boyd, worried by reports that the colony was on the brink of civil war, decided to see for himself. From all over the region, Ashantis traveled to Kamasi to make their strength of feeling known to him. We were greeted by a crowd of, I don't know, 10,000, many thousand Ashanti chanting and bearing banners, some of them dressed in brown, the colour of mourning, the banners saying things like, British don't go, we don't want independence, five weeks before the declared date for independence. And uh, there was a great deal of noise and shouting and display, but uh, not, in fact, any misbehaviour, I don't think. That night, 
the Asanta Heaney was able to talk to Lennox Boyd at a dinner arranged by Colin Russell. And I think Lennox Boyd was very impressed with the uh, courtesy, the genuineness, the strength of appeal of the Asante Hini, who, who loved his people and really was their king. And I think Lennox Boyd wanted to do what he could to help the Ashantis. You know, words, just like myself and the other administrative officers in Ashanti, we wanted to help the Ashantis. Naturally, we wanted to see independence coming, but we did want to see some safeguards for the Ashanti. Lennox Boyd flew back to Accra, convinced that some element of power for the regions must be included in the new constitution. Well, Lennox Boyd came smartly up against an immovable object, namely the governor, who was in no way disposed to see anything altered at that stage. No detail of his plan. And although I think they had some fairly amicable discussions, Arden Clark, who was a pretty persuasive fellow, I think um, managed not exactly to persuade Boyd, but to insist that his point of view was the only correct one. And if Boyd started tinkering about with the Constitution at this late stage, then there was going to be trouble and there would have to be gunboats and things like that. Lennox Boyd returned to London and insisted that Nkrumah's two most powerful ministers be sent to see him. He told them that regional assemblies would be included in the new constitution. That was the price of independence. At a London press conference, they appeared to have accepted this with good grace. Well, the constitution which uh, has been uh, laid before Parliament is not different in any way from either the constitution of Canada or Australia or Ceylon. Uh, there have been a few clauses uh, put in, in to make uh, provision for our particular circumstances in the Gold Coast. If we accepted any ideas about regionalism at all, it was just a stop to get independence brought to us or given to us. Uh, but we never really intended to divide the country up uh, what they had failed to achieve to do it for them. Some of the ideas had to be washed away. Nkrumah made his own position on the Constitution clear to his private secretary. There was an occasion um, just before full independence, when I was working directly for Nkrumah for, for a period, and, um, and Nkrumah w w was proposing to, to do something or other which, which, which wasn't in accordance with the Constitution, and I, and I, I pointed this out to him. And he, he, he said very directly, and positively, when I, when I told him that, that, that this was unconstitutional, he said, Mr. Codrington, I can drive a coach and horses through this constitution. And after independence, I certainly will. Although, sure enough, he did, too. Independence came on March the 6th, 1957. began as agitator, then he became popular leader. He continued to go further, and now he is Ghana's prime minister. Ghana. Ghana is the name. Ghana. We wish to proclaim, we will be jolly, merry and gay, the 6th of March, Independence Day. Ghana was the first black African country to win its freedom. Within the next 10 years, another 31 were to gain independence. The battle has ended. And thus, Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. From now on, there is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing all of us. I want you all, those who have hats on, to take off your hats and let the bank raise our national anthem. And from now on, 
That national anthem is the national anthem of the Gogo to be played on all occasions. Forgotten the 6th of March 1957 when the Gold Coast successfully get your independence official. Ghana, Ghana is the name. Ghana, we wish to proclaim we will be jolly, merry, and gay. The 6th of March Independence Day. There's a hardcover book of this series available from the ABC shop in your capital city. End of Empire will return in two weeks. Next Sunday, we'll bring you the premiere of Wagner's epic music drama, The Ring, beginning with The Rhine Girl. Don't miss the simulcast of the controversial Bayreuth centenary production of part one of Wagner's Ring, next Sunday at 8.30. Stay with us now for our stereo special, Schulte and the Chicago, following the news. We wish to proclaim, we will be jolly, merry and gay, the 6th of March, Independence Day.